It's now two years since Haiti was devastated by a magnitude 7 earthquake. Since then, only half the promised aid has been delivered. You're watching Inside Story Americas from Washington. Haiti is one of the most impoverished nations and least developed countries in the world. And since the region's worst earthquake in 200 years, the country has been struggling with political upheaval, health crises, and an annual barrage of hurricanes. The 7.0 magnitude quake killed more than 222,000 people and injured more than 300,000 others. At least one and a half million people were displaced from their homes. Many were resettled in makeshift camps like these. Others fled the city for rural areas. The interim Haiti Recovery Commission was set up to oversee the rebuilding and recovery. Led by Bill Clinton and Haiti's former Prime Minister Jean-Max Bellerive, many of the approved projects remain unfinished. While there has been some rebuilding, more than half a million Haitians are still living in tents. Since the earthquake, Haiti has experienced a cholera epidemic with more than half a million people infected. At least 7,000 have been killed. And four and a half million people, that's almost half the population, are experiencing food insecurity due to low wages and high food prices. Many Haitians live on less than $2 a day. Andy Gallagher filed this report from Port-au-Prince. In the two years since the earthquake, progress here has been painfully slow, although President Martelli just announced that this makeshift camp will close down in the next few days. But remember, there are still over half a million people living in shelters like this, extremely rudimentary conditions. And when they are moved, they're often moved to dangerous locations with no running water or electricity. And when you speak to Haitians on the street, they are extremely frustrated. There have been demonstrations over the past few days. And the one question is, where did all the money go? Now, some reports say much of it went to the US government, a lot to non-governmental organizations, but very little of it seems to have got into the hands of the people that need it. When you walk around Port-au-Prince and drive around Port-au-Prince, it's hard to see those projects that the billions of dollars raised are supposed to build. So for a continued recovery here, Haiti needs a few things. It needs patience, time, money, and of course, political stability. So why is it taking so long for Haiti to recover from the earthquake and what will it take to speed up the process? To discuss this, I'm joined by Kim Ives from the Haiti Liberté Newsweekly. He's also made several documentaries on Haiti. Also in the studio is Mark Weisbrot from the Center for Economic and Policy Research. He's written extensively on Haiti and international economic policy. And joining us from New York is Ray LaForest, a Haitian activist and community organizer. Welcome to all of you to the studio. Thank you. Thank you. Well, let's uh, take a look at some of those telling facts about the state of Haiti two years after that devastating earthquake. Two years on, half a million people are still living in tents. Almost a million people have no electricity. Only 200,000 people in Haiti have regular jobs, and 80% are surviving on just $2 a day, or less than $2 a day in many instances. Mark Weisblatt, what's gone wrong? Well, at first they didn't appropriate enough money even for the reconstruction. After the earthquake, the estimates were 10 to 14 billion just to reconstruct, not just you know relief and food and water. And they, they have pledged, the government's pledged about 5 billion, and they've dispersed, they say, according to official figures, about half of that. But a lot of that isn't even spent, you know. So they say it's dispersed, but it goes from one organization to another and it isn't even spent. So it's, it's just way too little money. And then a lot of it's not spent uh, effectively. You have 83% of the USAID contracts went to inside the Beltway contractors, uh, even including some that were uh, guilty of waste and fraud and abuse in, in Iraq and Afghanistan and in her, uh, Hurricane Katrina aftermath. And so uh, you have a lot of those uh, problems as well. You don't uh, have money going to the government. It's very hard to rebuild a country without a government. You know, we couldn't do that here, for example, after Katrina if we had no government. And uh, in 2011, the government actually received less aid uh, from the international community than it did in 2009 before the earthquake. And this was a government that was devastated. And of course, there's also the problem that uh, it's, it's a donor-driven thing. They don't, they're not involving the people who are actually affected. And that uh, is another way to make aid a lot less effective as well. All right, so a whole list of issues there. Kim Ives, let's look at the international uh, donor picture. Now, international aid donors have delivered uh, only about half of the 
billions of dollars promised for reconstruction. The U.S. promised $927 million, but it only delivered less than $300 million. Venezuela pledged slightly more than money than the U.S., $929 million, but it only managed to deliver $223 million. Japan is one of the few countries that met its pledge, providing $100 million. Now, a lot of money has not come through, but a lot of money has come through. What has happened to the money? Well, I think there are too many intermediaries, too many people in the way. I mean, if you calculate it, uh, I've seen figures as high as $12 billion total, which has been at least pledged to Haiti. If you, if you divided that by uh, uh, 10 million Haitian people, that'd be, what, about $1,000 a head. So you have, uh, uh, you know, too many NGOs. In fact, uh, you know, to me, <laughs> uh, if we just take the U.S. contribution alone, about 99% of it goes back to the Pentagon, the State Department, the NGOs, and the contractors. And 1% ends up in the hands of Haitians. So to me, that's the fundamental process. You know, the uh, growth of the Republic of NGOs, as Haiti is called, began about 40 years ago. Before that, Haiti could feed itself. It, it could clothe itself. It, it had its own industries. It had its own agriculture. Since they've come in, in fact, they've acted really as the proxies of these imperial policies of uh, the North coming into the country, destroying Haitian agriculture, destroying a lot of the country's self-sufficiency. And so to me, uh, even though they're posing as um, saviors, in many cases, they're making the matter worse. Okay, let's bring in Le Ray LaForest, who is in New York. Ray, you've worked extensively uh, with Haitians in Haiti as well. What is your assessment of the reconstruction and recovery effort, especially where it concerns the U.S.? Well, uh, I agree with what was said uh, by my two comrades there. Um, I should point out, though, that uh, the earthquake which created the, the problem we're dealing with now was anything but a natural phenomenon. And uh, Haiti has been under the, the, the rule of dictatorship since 1957, and coups against elected governments selected by the Haitian people, elected by the Haitian people, such as the Aristide the administration. Uh, so not only we have a system where the Haitian people, one more time, is not consulted or is not part of the solution, but it is treated as though it was a, an emergency. And uh, as Kim just pointed uh, very correctly, and this is not new. I remember I was in Haiti when President Aristide was uh, overthrown, and uh, and most of them, and he returned in uh, 1994. And when he was returned, some of the money didn't even get returned to the United States. It never left the United States. Uh, many of the, but much of the equipment, such as vehicles that they purchased, came from the U.S. and they were paid for by funds that were counted as part of the assistance. Uh, for example, uh, when, uh, when the earthquake happened, the United States sent troops to Haiti and very quickly decided they would control the airport and control what's happening in the country. And uh, that military presence was charged to the so-called assistance. And unfortunately, the result of that military presence at first was to prevent badly needed equ medical equipment and surgeons and so on from being present in Haiti. So that uh, based on what we saw, um, some of the uh, removal of, of limbs and so on that took place, a very painful process, obviously, were not would have not have been necessary if the doctors that were supposed to perform them were allowed to land in Haiti directly and to get the equipment. So there are many questions raised. And as was said earlier, also, the fact for the money to be doled out through uh, NGOs rather than directly to the Haitian government. Now, personally, I don't have that much respect for the present government of Haiti. However, this is still a government that would be, I would say, would be entitled. The, the normal process would be to bring the money through uh, representative of the Asian people. Okay. Um, Kim Ives, you know, the kind of engine that was set up to lead this recovery and reconstruction effort uh, was something known as the Interim Haiti Recovery Commission that we talked about. That was led by... Uh, Bill Clinton and Jean-Marc uh, Belrive, the uh, former prime minister there. Um, what has happened to the commission? I mean, its mandate ran out. What did it achieve, if anything? Well, not much. I mean, it uh, claims to have dispersed and uh, implemented some programs. But, I mean, fundamentally, it was flawed. Here was uh, a uh, body which, in fact, had been 
uh, a majority foreigners ended up being supposedly half and half, 13 Haitian, 13 uh, bank and foreign government representatives. But the Haitian representatives staged a rebellion several months ago saying they had no say at all into how the money was being spent and uh, dispersed. It was uh, just basically Bill Clinton, Bell Reeve, and uh, a guy who'd been a former USAID uh, 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 agent for many years. So they were making all the decisions and sending it everywhere. So I think, as uh, Ray was just saying, the Haitian population has been excluded from the decision-making process. They're not even allowed into the meetings at the log base. I remember uh, some months ago, I was in Haiti, they were uh, at the largest uh, IDP camp, in, in, internally displaced persons camp, on the uh, Jean-Marie uh, uh, Vincent camp uh, on the air, old airport uh, uh, runway out in uh, the middle of Port-au-Prince. They <laughs> had been trying to get a meeting with the UN officials, with the IHRC people, etc. They couldn't even get in there. They had to stage a demonstration to go down there, and that made it even less likely for them to get in. So the Haitian people are very frustrated at being essentially marginalized in their own salvation. Can that commission still be effective, I mean, if its mandate is extended, and it's up to the the Haitian parliament to extend that mandate. If it is extended, can it still be effective? Uh, I don't think so. To me, uh, fundamentally, uh, Bill Clinton, uh, despite his mea culpas about uh, destroying Haitian agriculture by favoring Arkansas uh, rice farmers and allowing them to dump their rice on Haiti uh, during the 90s, uh, despite the fact he is essentially an agent of U.S. corporate interests, and to me, uh, fundamentally, uh, it, it needs to be Haitians. As uh, Mark Weisbrot's uh, group has uh, pointed out, uh, uh, only, uh, what is it, 12, 20 percent of the uh, uh, contracts have gone to Haitians. Um, it's most it's a lot less than that. Right? Yeah, even less than that. Uh, I remember speaking to one of the Haitian contractors um, years ago, and he was speaking with Leslie Voltaire, who's long been a sort of... Uh, 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 agent of uh, the U.S. Uh, who said that it's 15 percent which is being earmarked for Haitian contractors. All the rest went to American and other foreign uh, contractors. This is, this is absurd. Right. You know, Mark Weisbrot, I want to just talk about that point. You brought that up earlier on, how the money is distributed in Haiti. Uh, there was a deputy from the Haitian parliament who complained that, you know, the bulk of the money that's coming in for aid and reconstruction is going to NGOs is going to private contractors, very little money going to ministries which would enable those ministries to build capacity. No, that's absolutely right. And it's, uh, that's been the problem for decades, as, as everyone has pointed out here. And it has to do with the United States, you know, really not even ever wanting to see an independent government there, really. I mean, our government has overthrown the government of Haiti twice already in the last uh, 20 years, once in 91. And then again in 2004, where they did it kind of in broad daylight, and put, kidnapped the president and put him on a plane, one of those rendition planes, and took him to Africa. And installed the government in 2011. That's <laughs> right. They <laughs> manipulated the, the OAS in order to change the results of the election uh, last year. So it's part of the same process. I mean, one thing I, I, I want to say, and, and I don't think anybody here disagree with, you know, there are some NGOs that do really good work. And one, for example, is Partners in Health. You know, and they, they build the building this big hospital in, in Mirabelle. And I think they have a different approach. You know, their whole intention is to build the capacity of the government. It's going to be a public hospital. It's going to be part of the health uh, ministry. And they're not trying to replace the government. They're trying to help uh, build it. And Which is what the Cubans and Venezuelans do as well. So yeah. it doesn't have to be this way. It's not mm -hmm. inherently going to be this way. OK, let's go to, uh, back to Ray LaForest in New York. Uh, Ray, one of the concerns we've heard from uh, potential donor countries is that they are a little bit reluctant to donate funds to Haiti uh, because they fear that the Haitian government would not be able to administer those funds properly. Is that a valid concern? Well, to some extent it is. Uh, um, we know that uh, s the president of Haiti's past has been connected to the Juvali regime and. Uh, the system was known for killing and stealing, and uh, that would be legitimate. And again, the question turns uh, what was alluded before by Mark, that uh, uh, we need the Haitian people's participation. But it has to be done to legitimate representative of that people. Those people voted unanimously. Uh, sorry, uh, about 68 percent of them voted for President Aristide at some point. And, uh, is just that the agenda, the demand of the Haitian people that the violence be ended, that they be provided with minimal needs and jobs and security, 
uh, went against what the system wanted. They, uh, when ICID went out and, and doubled the minimum salary from one to two dollars, that was completely unacceptable to the Haitian upper class, uh, which lives on hundreds of millions of dollars, and to American businessmen. And um, so, so for us, it's a, it's a, the Asian people has to survive through this and learn from the process. But ideally, the first step would be, it's as I said earlier, that the catastrophe was not a natural one. What we need is true elections that truly elect representative of Haitian people's needs and desires, that reflect their own priorities, and then the assistance would come to that government and be executed. Kim just mentioned Cuba. And unfortunately, Cuba does not get enough credit. Today, when the Haitian peasant tells you that he saw his nurse or his doctor, most of the time he's talking about a Cuban doctor. And these people have provided assistance to Haiti before the earthquake. Uh, many, more than something like some 13 years ago, they've been, they were there. And um, they do it with respect. They do it uh, in other areas also, such as fishing and so on, where the idea is to supplement, to, to respect the people's culture and their own political priorities rather than take over. Uh, if, although sometimes, as you said earlier, some of the NGOs are well-meaning and some of them do actually well. But in terms of using those resources, for example, uh, I realize Haiti is a difficult and scary place. These individuals get uh, uh, rent paid for, transportation, they have a car and so on, uh, which is what the Haitian companies do not get. And uh, when you get, when you add it up, it comes to a tremendous amount of money. So the administrative cost uh, is, is very high. And in the case, we know, for example, at some point that the Red Cross, even in this country, was taking an inordinate and outrageous amount of money went for salaries and administrative costs. So these are all issues that would have to be resolved uh, for Haiti to turn the page and move forward to the future in a different way. Right. Kim, is there a danger that, you know, we're only two years uh, after the earthquake, second anniversary right now, but is there a danger that as the years go by, uh, the international community could get something which is known as aid fatigue, you know, where they say, well, look, we've heard about this, people uh, suffering out there in the world, we've been asked to donate money, and it just goes on, and there's no interest, they lose interest, and Haiti could fall victim to that. Well, I think uh, there isn't too much danger of that. They, this is a business. It's, it's a racket, I could say. Uh, and there's a lot of people making money off it, and they have an interest in seeing it continue. To me, the, the issue is the, U the U.S. principally, with France and Canada and others uh, b behind them, have um, an interest in keeping uh, uh, control of Haiti. And that's why they have a U.N. military occupation installed in the country. The country's not at war with anybody, and yet these peacekeepers are there now, going on eight years. It's costing close to a billion dollars a year to keep them there. That money could be going to the Haitians, $850 million a year to pay about 9,000 to 13,000 foreign troops to come in and point guns at people who are trying to sell food in the dust. Uh, it's not right. It's a question of uh, the aid is becomes a way of really uh, maximizing distribution of products from the U.S., uh, from other countries, and uh, crushing, to me, what is Haitian agriculture and Haitian self-sufficiency. Yeah, if I, I could take off on that, because, you know, uh, Kim mentioned the U.N., and that money, that $850 million they're spending each year on this force, which doesn't really have a legitimate peacekeeping mission there, um, you know, it wasn't a post-conflict situation or a war. In, you know, that's eight times what the U.N. is spending uh, to contain cholera, which they brought to the country. And that's a huge thing. I mean, 7,000 people have died. 500,000, more than 7,000, more than 500,000 have been infected. What is the situation right now as far as the cholera epidemic is concerned? Well, it's, it, it's still terrible. I mean, it's come down now because it does in the dry season, but you saw what happened last year. But in April, we got the rainy season coming yeah, back. And, yeah, and, and a lot of the NGOs cut back on their uh, treatment centers, and then uh, it spiked again uh, to, you know, it went from like... Uh, uh, um, 20,000 to 50,000 cases a, a month in, in, in the rainy season. So this is, uh, but, but the thing that I think is so outrageous 
is that the United Nations brought this disease here. Now, they didn't do it on purpose, but it's gross negligence. It's, it's really uh, just as bad as Bhopal in, in India 35 years ago. Okay? They didn't do that on purpose either. But uh, they, had a, they brought a disaster to India that killed thousands of people. And this is going to continue to kill people. And the only way you're going to really get rid of it is to improve uh, or get it down to very low levels is to improve the water and sanitation infrastructure. And the United Nations still continues to deny responsibility, even though you've had now studies, the own UN study, the New England Journal of Medicine, the Center for Disease Control, another team of 15 uh, scientists who actually got the strains of, of cholera from Nepal, which is where it came from. And all the evidence is there, and they're just trying to deny it because they don't want to do anything. They are facing legal action, though. Yeah, but that's, that's a long shot. I mean, I, I really respect the groups that are doing it, including the Institute for Justice and Democracy for Haiti, but that's a really uphill battle. The UN, I mean, it's really against all their principles to say, to just try and deny it. And you, can you imagine this happening in any other country? Can you imagine? So, you know, they never had cholera before. So they brought something that's gonna kill people there for years. And, and just nobody even it takes responsibility for it, even acknowledges it, and nobody says, well, we need to know how this happened. And with all these NGOs and with this occupation, you still have the worst cholera epidemic in the world right now in Haiti and, and only a year and some months old. Well, let's, let's take a look at some of the recent changes in Haiti, good or bad. Now, work has started on an industrial park by a South Korean garment manufacturer. The Haitian government says it will create employment for 20,000 people. Before the earthquake, half of Haiti's children had no access to schools. Those that did had to pay. Now, aid money has allowed hundreds of thousands to receive an education. The new government is giving tax breaks to foreign companies to set up businesses. Already, one international hotel chain recently announced plans for a new hotel in the capital. Now, some of that sounds very laudable, you know, the fact that they're setting up factories there, etc. But it's turned out that they also are paying slave wages as well. This is a problem because this is the exact economic model of Jean-Claude Duvalier 30 years ago. Basically, sweatshops and tourism. This is what they're proposing for Haiti. Haiti, first of all, needs to be able to feed itself. It needs investment in agriculture, fertilizer. And uh, this is what's, in, in fact, being subverted by this emphasis. This land that was taken in the north, Caracol, the new project where they're supposedly going to create 20,000 jobs, it's also going to create another city, Soleil, which is the slum, uh, teeming slum, which uh, was created by the uh, assembly factories in Port-au-Prince. Uh, it was built on the most fertile land in the region. It's an ecological disaster. This is by the very people who studied the matter. It, it, the area was uh, done, a UN agency said the area was worth uh, 1 billion, 300 million in, in terms of economic benefits, however they qualify, qualify that ecologically. Uh, it's uh, pristine uh, coral reefs, right. uh, um, or mangrove reefs. So this is the kind of, uh, th these policies uh, are in fact uh, counterproductive, I think. Okay, I just want to go to Ray LaForest in New York uh, for his take on the fact that three quarters of a million Haitian children are now able to go back to school. Well, uh, we want to verify that. Uh, we understand that there's some issues as to uh, where the money was coming from. Uh, uh, well, no, I'm sorry, the money that, that they're raising from uh, calls made within Haiti and uh, people, Haitians making donations from In abroad. international calls. That the mon mm -hmm. Yes, that the money has not been accounted for. So apparently, um, uh, the president has taken an attitude that almost like, since this is not being approved officially by Congress, that this is almost like a private business at this point. So this is outrageous. Um, but as we said earlier, if we saw this happen um, after the overthrow of Aristide, we saw institution, uh, actually Kim, one of Kim's groups uh, put out a, a, a documentary uh, a while back, which is somewhat dated, but pretty relevant to the issue called uh, Bitter Cane. And what it analyzed was the reason, it makes it easy for people to understand the reason why the United States would be in Haiti. Uh, besides guaranteeing a political system that would follow the dictate, but an economic system where people don't pay tax very often, workers are paying subsistence, subsistence wages. And uh, uh, in, like in the case, I, I don't know what the specifics will be here, that companies were not paying taxes and the baby dog for it would them 10 years to pay tax. And at some point, it was just right. nominal. 
and then they paid bribes directly to the government. Okay. Ray, so we what we see happening, and we think they understand that, is that the Haitian people will not tolerate it. So therefore, okay. they're trying to create a Haitian army that will right. keep people in check. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. Uh, we've run out of time. Gentlemen, I want to say thanks to all of you for joining us. That's Thank it from the team here in Washington, D.C. for now, but we want to hear from you. Tell us what stories you think we should be covering. Send your ideas directly to us at InsideStory at AljazeeRa.net. Bye for now.